and also with you. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. May his grace and peace be with you. May he fill our hearts with joy. Almighty God, to, to you, you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
goes from Italy in the west all the way to Mesopotamia, that is modern Iraq and Iran in the east, and down to North Africa to Egypt. So, here we go. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the whole host where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each one of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven, living in Jerusalem. And at the sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard it in his or her own language. Amazed and astonished, they said, are not these who are speaking Galileans? How can they speak in our languages? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belong to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Jews and proselytes, that is converts, Cretans and Arabs. We all hear in our own language about God's deeds of power. So they were all amazed, but they were perplexed too, saying to one another, what does this mean? But some people said, oh, they're all drunk. At that, Peter got up and he said, he raised his voice, people of Judea, all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. Listen to what I'm saying. They're not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what is spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old people shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I will show portents in the heavens, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious final day. That everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. This morning we'll be reading Psalm 104, verses 25 through 35, and then jumping to 37. That can be found in the Green Book of Alternative Services, beginning at page 844. We'll read the psalm, Breaking at the Asterisks, where I will read the first part, and you will read the, the, the second part in the, the verse. Uh, the refrain is found in your bulletin. Their ships and their 
and there is that Leviathan. All of them look to you to give them food in their new season. You give it to them, they gather it. You hide your face, and they are terrified. You take away the bread, and they die and return to the dust. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. And so you renew the face of the earth. This morning is St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them. given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thank you, God. Our gradual hymn today is number 646. We'll sing the first two verses before the reading of the Holy Gospel and verses 3 and 4 following the reading. Six, four, six.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory, Glory to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise be to you, Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. In fact, you can find the regulations for the festival set out 
in, I think it's the 7th century BC, Old Testament book of Leviticus, Jewish pilgrims from all over the world gathered in Jerusalem to observe it, so that on that Pentecost, not long after the first Easter, there were dwelt in Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven, as it says in our epistle lesson. Now what they offered there at Pentecost would have been physical things, material offerings, probably sacrifices of lamb or goats or something, and loaves of bread. And the people who were offering those things knew that God didn't really need those things. They were signs and tokens of the spiritual thankfulness and faithfulness of those people that were there, and of obedience to God's commandments. <clears throat> It was a festival in which God was worshipped as the author of every good and perfect gift. Above all, the gift of his spirit, inspiring and enlightening the prophet and the sage, and filling our spirits with expectation and hope in, divine, in the divine promise. The one that Peter quoted in his little sermon in the middle of that Corinthians reading, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh of your sons, and daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And upon the servants and upon the handmaids of those days will I pour out my spirit. Well, what about us now? In our church calendar, every Pentecost day marks the end of one season and the beginning of another. Easter season has ended. Last Sunday we heard how, 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, and as I was so glad, Geraldine, that you gave that background as people were hearing it because it really makes a difference. Forty days after Jesus' resurrection, he left them. He went up to heaven with the words, You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. He ascended to heaven. He was no longer walking the earth. And ten days later, now at Pentecost, was the 50th day. The last and the Pentecost season, the last half of the church year, begins. I expect, though, that the Bible readings we've just heard, though possibly, possibly familiar, they may, may seem a little disconnected, so I'll try to clarify that. You see, our gospel, the last one we heard, the one that I read, described an event late on Easter Day, in Jesus' first post-resurrection appearance, to a collection of his close followers, when he himself breathed the Holy Spirit on them and told them to go out to others, this small group, to spread God's love and peace, just as he had done for them. Earlier in the day, outside the tomb, he had spoken to and commissioned Mary Magdalene, and this account of it is written by the Gospel writer John. And yes, this was weeks before Pentecost, but the spirit, the task, the commission, and even the authority to forgive th sins were given to them. The long passage from the Acts of the Apostles that Geraldine read may also be pretty familiar to you. I think a lot of people remember that one. There were the disciples at Pentecost gathered, and what happened? The spirit did come in a way that was not exactly the Spirit, the Comforter, right? that's what we call the Holy Spirit, does not exactly sound comforting at all. The earth shook, the wind blew, tongues of fire descended, and they began to speak in languages they didn't even know before, all from the Holy Spirit. The crowd that was gathered around them, people from different places, were amazed to hear these Galileans speaking in their own languages. And Peter, one of his disciples, gave as I said, as we call a sermon for them, telling the onlookers they're not drunk, but this was indeed the word of God. So a really dramatic event with a very great deal of what can be only be called disruption. One author has said this, disruption is exactly what also marked the rest of their lives, talking here about the apostles, after that day. All the disciples went on to face struggle and persecution. They traveled to faraway places, and many of them eventually were martyred for their actions and faith. They bore witness to an amazing truth 
and many, many people came to know God through their efforts, but in worldly terms, they surely paid a price. I think we have to ask ourselves, would we be here today talking about this if it were not for them? But they were not alone. God was with them, just as they had been promised. Their lives were never the same. Had they not been commissioned, given a task and the authority to do it, and sent to go share the good news, they could, as someone has said, has said have savored the truth of the resurrection for themselves, cherishing the pleasant memory of Jesus' resurrected presence into their ripe old age, and just enjoy it for the rest of their lives. But that's not what happened for them. They went out. That day of wind and fire was the very first birthday of the church, and the mission was clear to go out and to tell others the good news of God and God's love shown to us through Jesus. And part of all of that big commotion is why we wear red at Pentecost and why the altar is dressed in red, the fire, the monuments of that ground. And that's the long ago part of today's story. But, 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 now we are the church. It's our turn. And why should we expect anything different? Should we not expect the Holy Spirit to bring challenges and opportunities to us too? Good but difficult challenges? For sharing the news at great cost is not something that ended hundreds of years ago. People like Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the 1940s, Martin Luther King Jr. in the 1960s, and many persecuted Christians today show us this. Of course, most of us will never face physical danger on account of our faith. But for us too, the Holy Spirit doesn't magically solve our problems or give us a quiet life. But instead it gives us an assurance of God's presence, a courage that can help us in our personal hard times, and as well courage to reach out to others in faith. That's my hope for myself and my hope for you. Not to be shy to express our consciousness of God's order to the world and for all. For you see, rather than settle the turbulence of life, the Spirit helps us just keep going forward through that. Life is, as the saying goes, just one thing after another. And no matter how young or old, fast or slow, strong or frail we may be, we keep going in the way we can. For this is the very same spirit given to Jesus at his baptism, which immediately, though it was a peaceful dove, drove him into the wilderness. He was given courage, and we are too. God creates and loves and reaches out to his beloved creation, and we are sent to help with that in our very own lives and our very own way. Even when life throws things, throws thing after thing at us, and like those apostles, there will always be something small or big that we can be doing for God and neighbor to show the love of God. A book has been written about a doctor who devoted his life to improve the health of people in very poor countries, whose philosophy is summed up in a Haitian proverb that teaches that in this life and world, when you solve one problem, there's always another waiting for you. What the proverb calls mountains beyond mountains, always another mountain to climb. In other words, for him, disruption is just the way life is if, if you live it trying to help others, trying to do work for God. And with each mountain, each challenge, God, the Holy Spirit, is there to help you see the possibilities so that for this man, his mission is not a burden, but a gift. So now I'm going to get to what we all need to think through in this time and in this place right here at St. Mark's. Let's consider our situation. We too are disciples given a job to do for God. What should we do here? We have a wonderful opportunity now to keep our foothold here in this sacred space and grow our mission and ministry and outreach outside our walls. We have constant faith, and we have new ideas. 
And the more we do, I know, the more ideas we'll have. Even during these COVID years, where togetherness and faith has upheld us, and we've reached people in new ways, we found new ways to do that. But the command to go and make disciples does not say, stay within a building of bricks and mortar and beauty. Those apostles went out with no purse, no shoes, nothing. Is this idea given at Pentecost of going and making disciples compatible with being attached to this church, our home together? For me, to answer that, one of the classic questions is, what is the church? And there are several proper parts to that. It is people. So from the outside, it may be a place where we can be found and seen doing what church people do. Welcoming, serving others, teaching God's love. This is where we do that. How it, is it embedded in the neighborhood around us? Well, it seems to me that the answer to why we're rooted here, why people may feel rooted wherever they are, has a lot to do with what we are, the creatures we are. We're children of God, every person is. And we're made of both body and spirit. Being in a body is how we know each other at all in this life. So physical presence matters. And the people whom God puts in our path, in our neighborhood, we need to ensure that they can see themselves in this place and be part of this people. It doesn't mean they have to be like us or even worship like us. But they need to know that we are here and that God is here for them. This is what it truly should always stand for. Our doors and hearts will always, I pray, open and never close. For this is a place we come together to try to make the world a better place. It's a place that encourages us and where together as a community we know that God is with us as sisters and brothers and siblings together. It is a place where underlying everything our helping with others and of each other is made possible through our prayer and worship and our sacraments. So let's rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit who challenges and comforts and walks beside us. Let's let others know too. And let's love others and make of this old world a new world. Let's get out there. And now on page 188, let's stand and say together the mighty decree. Let us confess our faith as we say, We believe in one God, God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen.
so that I can get on from day to day. It's a lovely setting for festival prayers. Come.
Let the Spirit be the Son of the Church, continue to work in the world, to the hearts of all who believe. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Thank you. 
say our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. But deliver us from evil, but deliver us from evil.
in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always.
Huh? 